Welcome to the Tapestry of Life on CCP-TV, Community College of Philadelphia's educational channel. I am Dr. Pascal Scholes, Professor of Behavioral Health and Human Services and Director of the Office of Collegiate Recovery at Community College of Philadelphia. Today's topic is race and drugs. There are a lot of ways to explain the recent wave of compassion for white opiate addicts. Historically, where were all those compassionate individuals for the crack cocaine epidemic when it was destroying the black and Hispanic neighborhoods? Where were the voices of compassion in the 1980s? For crack addiction, we offer jail for the opiate crisis. We offer compassion and treatment. Clearly, race is a factor in how we label and deal with drug abuse. To discuss this topic today, I want to welcome back my co-host, Rick Ford, from the Department of Behavioral Health and Intellectual Disabilities, and my two very special guests, Ron Crawford and Andre Reed. Well, you know, uh, when we were preparing for this show, I, I started reading up on some other things, you know, yeah. and uh, as I kind of getting organized around it, and, and it became increasingly more aware to me uh, that through my addiction, there was no real problem because we were enmeshed in, in the, the wave of the addiction. Yeah. But in recovery, and when I started teaching here, I came to the realization that a lot of the public policy really is discriminatory mm -hmm. toward people of color. And I, I preface the, the conversation with this. Addictions, addictions, addiction. And every mother and every brother and every sister and every parent, no matter who they lose, it's a loss. Mm. What I think we're going to try and talk about is the discriminatory issues that surround people of color mm. and people who, quote, historically have been identified as Indeed. white. We're not disparaging anyone who lived through, you know, death right. with their kids or mm -hmm. with their yeah. loved ones yeah. or something like that. But I thought it was a topic uh, that uh, we should shed some light on. Indeed. And it's a, a light that needs to really um, have a, a spot to it. Yeah. So I don't know where you might want to start. Uh, I mean, I know all of you over the years in different, uh, from different places. I mean, this guy I've known for, <laughs> I don't know, 30 years or something yeah, like that. Indeed. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but I could start. I'll start with this, and I'll think about this how drugs mm -hmm. had done something that some of our great leaders have been trying to do for a long time. Follow me. Martin Luther King died trying to bring peace and equality. Mm -hmm. Malcolm X died trying to bring peace and equality. John F. Kennedy died trying to bring peace and equality. Drugs have done something that some of our great leaders have been trying to do, bring black folk and white folk together. So when you look at that in addition. In the pursuit of happiness. In pursuit of <laughs> happiness, right. So, uh, you know, race and drugs is a great conversation. It's, it's thought-provoking thought where people can take a look at this. We go back to the crack epidemic. Mm -hmm. um, for, for black and brown people, mm -hmm. they were arresting us for crack. Mm -hmm. it, it wasn't so much about treatment. If you right. look at the, the level of homelessness mm -hmm. during that time because the way crack came in on us, where well, we were being prosecuted and arrested. We weren't being uh, rescued with treatment of nothing like that. That's right. So now that's fast forward, looking at what's happening here in, in 2018 with the opiate epidemic. You guys are experts at this. You guys know what's the ratio. They're getting rescued, not arrested. When we did crack, we were getting arrested and not rescued. Right. You were getting arrested and sent to jail. That's why the jails were so filled up, as yeah. they say. But the only difference is with this and talking a lot to the opiate community and having a relationship with the opiate community and working out in, a, in the system. The drug itself in the 80s didn't actually kill you, the drug use. It diminished your lifestyle. Right. It brought destruction to the community. Mm -hmm. um, You're was, talking it, about the heroin? The crack. Yeah, or okay. crack. It was, okay. it was treated in a punitive way. 
um, by locking the dealers up, locking the you know the addicts up. But with this opiate thing, this thing actually kills you. Mm -hmm. Use kills you, and, and I'm not saying that drug use is not destructive, and people don't die through the use of drugs. But some sometimes I, I see the difference, and and I understand there's race and bias in this opiate use disorder epidemic we mm -hmm. have, right? But the loss of lives, innocent people would go to you, will go to use and not know that they maybe think they're taking a Percocet and not know that it's laced with fentanyl mm -hmm. and die. So we had 1,700 deaths last year in Philadelphia, over, over those deaths, uh, more deaths now happening than accidents, right? So mm -hmm. car accidents throughout the whole nation. Um, so yeah, it is discrimination, but the only thing in my experience is that crack did destroy you, but rarely seldom was it a was it a chance that if you smoked coke you would die. True. This thing, it's you, this thing is a Russian roulette game. Well, let me maybe couch it in a different way. If many of the killings, overdoses from heroin were people of color, which it's not, it's mainly white. Yeah traditionally kill white people. Right. Uh, would we have such an outcry and would we still have a thought that we need to rehabilitate and treat or would it just say, well, you know, they're just, uh, you know, people of color and they're junkies and they're yeah. do 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 yeah. like we did with cocaine. Now, I know cocaine doesn't kill, but I wonder if in the 80s when we had that epidemic, if the majority of the people on crack were White. White. <laughs> I wonder if we would have had a different reaction to it instead of imprisoning them. Remember, um, I think something like 30% of the population originally were people of color or 35 at that time. Yeah, right. And 75% of the and prison, prison you know, is that way. Color, Do you right. think that, and here's the point which goes to the topic, if that was reversed? Right. I agree. Yeah, you see? I agree. Yeah. If, if the deaths were majority people of color, would we be seeing an outcry of services uh, applied to the community um, dealing with this right yeah. now? I don't think so. I don't think it would be such an outcry. I don't think the um, president, I was watching uh, MSNBC the other day, and I kind of started seeing how biases was being towards uh, this opiate use disorder deaths. And, uh, one of the anchor person, you know, talked to a person. Son had died, and he got, but he was from Fox. He recently got, you know, and his son died, and he get called up to the White House and want to sit down and console him. And um, and a loss is a loss, like we so we saying mm -hmm. that a death is a death. We're not saying that everybody yeah, feels yeah, pain yeah, yeah. and death. I'm not. I didn't look at it for him. I can understand um, what the father's feeling, but the uh, the response he got. Mm. Mm -hmm. Invitation to the White House, and, and yeah. all, you know uh, how many people of mm -hmm. color had died out there. You know, um, my whole generation back in the '80s. You know, I come from Baltimore. Baltimore had already dealt with this opiate use disorder. Baltimore was nothing but a dope city. Baltimore didn't have the crack epidemic. Didn't whitewash Baltimore like it did Philadelphia in the mm -hmm. '80s. It was heroin. And yeah. a lot of times, my dad says they didn't get it for you when you was out there. You know, methadone was a thing that you had to be an over black man. You had to be white. Life was washed up. You had to go to prison. You had to have some stuff before they would even put you on methadone. That's right. You had to have track marks. They wanted to see track marks. They wanted to see a whole lot of stuff. They wanted jail. They wanted. They wanted. They they used methadone as like a last uh, effort measure effort to your life. You would have to be at the end of your life, and they said, okay, we're gonna put. I'm yeah, well, we'll you know, when methadone, it was, it, go somewhere and die. when methadone first came out, I think it was under the Nixon administration. Right. Mm -hmm. And what was it supposed to do? It was supposed to quiet down the riots. That's right. And the deaths and, and the crime and, associated yeah. with heroin use. Yeah. It so wasn't for treatment. They medicate them, they'll it wasn't slow for, the whole thing down. It, it wasn't for treatment. Another interesting thing about um, comparing the crack epidemic to the opiate epidemic, the usage of crack or the abuse of crack was so minimized we didn't even analyze it like we're analyzing the opiate epidemic. Okay. Now, hear me out. When you talk about, um, and Andre made an excellent point about the level of death that occurs in opiate addiction, but had we been more interested in the crack epidemic, we would have saw that, I don't know if just as many people died, but they died differently. Mm -hmm. See, crack, when crack ravaged the communities 
in the inner cities back in the mid 80s and early 90s, yeah. those neighborhoods were like war zones. Mm. So there were casualties amongst gangs fighting, the yeah. crime. And yeah. beatings so among loved of, ones right, and stuff. Right. Yeah. So you didn't die by, using, by having a heroin overdose. You might have died by two warring drug, drug gangs, yeah, well, you know. Yeah, you know it, yeah. it was just dangerous. It was just, but another point that we fail to realize is that the crack epidemic was associated with the increase in the prison population. Yeah, Because definitely. in around 30, 30 years, 30 so years, you know, the prison population increased from about 300,000 to over 2 million. Mm -hmm. And that resulted in a lot of private prisons making mm -hmm. a whole lot of money. And right. So we needed to use crack to mm -hmm. lock people up so we can get people working for 11 cents an hour under the 13th Amendment, which means that, you know, we're going to free slaves, but you can be forced to work as slave wages if you're being convicted or punished of a crime. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there was a connection. I think it was a need for crack cocaine. That's why they probably didn't well, work that hard to you, stop it. You know, we think about the, the topic itself, race and drugs, and I'll go back to the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. when, when you look at the ratio of how many black and brown people were in the Vietnam War upon coming home being traumatized, those guys, and you alluded to this, they were all, and one president wrote a book. He said those people are, are criminals, mm -hmm. they're drug addicts, uh, you lock them up, right? And, and that's how they were labeled. But now here we are fast forwarding now, that ain't our drug, and I wanna be clear about that. Historically, black men and brown people didn't do heroin and like that, and if they did, they eventually move transition to something else, alcoholism and, and marijuana and so on, so on. But people need to take a look at how race and drugs play currently as today. They're providing, and I think of Andy Reid and all these high political people who say, oh wow, my son's on that stuff. Right, that's right. You know, we, yeah. gotta get him, we gotta get him some help. All across the nation, this ain't just Philadelphia, all across the nation. Prime example, and I'm not gonna name the organization, I went to do a speaking engagement uh, at a local treatment facility here in the city of Philadelphia. Walking in that room, they were having Bible study. There were 15 people there for Bible study. At the conclusion of Bible study, during my presentation in this auditorium, whenever you walk in a room on the wall, it'll tell you you can't exceed this number. That number was 199. Mm. When it was time for me to speak, that room came up to 215 people. 78% of those people in there were all of not of black or brown descent. Mm -hmm. So this thing is, is people really need to pay attention to what's happening. As we sit here now, somebody out there dying. Mm -hmm. Somebody shooting dope right now. Um, some phone is ringing some way with bad information on the other end. Some families are in route to the morgue to identify the body. It's a serious thing, and you better look at drugs and race as we speak today. Mm. Well, let's be honest, though. If we want to, it was never. It was always a white thing. Well, heroin, opiates. Yeah, the opiates. Opiates yeah. was always a white thing. Propaganda made you think with the New York when they would send newspapers out and say, you know, they would they would stereotype a drug dealer, Nicky Barnes, and certain dealer, drug dealers, and, and and bring movies like Frank Luger's American <laughs> Gangster. And they made you think that that was a black thing. That was it was always it was it was always a white thing mm -hmm. from the guys coming home from Civil War. We had a morphine epidemic back then because the soldiers, was, most of the white soldiers coming home from the Civil War, were strung out. Uh, the, 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 the greatest thing or the most destructive thing that ever happened to the, the drug addiction was a hypodermic needle. Who highly used hypodermic needles? White people who got them from Sears and Robot catalog. So when we look at the opiate use disorder, we look at opiates in a whole place, it was always a white drug. Mm -hmm. So we we saying yeah. like now is becoming, now that it's happening to the white community, it always had white. Mm -hmm. Bias and race is why it's happening to the white community again today. Because if a black man walked into a doctor with pain, the doctor would be discriminatory against prescribing him pain medications. So what happened was you had white people walking in the doctors and their doctors just wrote them pain medication without impunity, just kept writing them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They would discriminate against me. So you can almost say do, do race and discrimination, a tsunami passed the black community. Mm. Race came, 
in this term, race has, race became a saving fact yeah. growing up. Bias became a, a, skim, a discrimination <laughs> a became a saving yeah, fact yeah. growing up because we can't go to a doctor well, and say I need pain medication. Doctors wipe me some pain medication. White women and white men could walk into their doctors and get treated with main pain medications at a higher proportion than black people could, right? Mm -hmm. So you were taking them home, you were putting them in your medicine cabinet, and your kids were going to high school and they were stealing them. Mm -hmm. Black people didn't know nothing about Oxycontins and stuff like that. That's why they became names like hillbilly heroin. And, and that's why you got towns up in West Virginia where you got less than a thousand to maybe a less than 13 or 10,000 people, but they prescribed a million pills. Mm -hmm. White people yeah. were more, uh, it was more appropriate for a white man or white woman to dress up, present to a doctor, and the doctor just wrote him because he didn't see anything dest destructive in him. But if I wrote, first thing he thought I was going, going to take them pills and sell them to the street. I was going to abuse them. I was going to misuse them. Mm -hmm. So he scrutinized him. He made me feel so bad for coming in here that I got out of his office and never went back. <laughs> yeah. And if I so, was in a hospital, and let's say this in closing, if I was in a hospital, if I said my mother's in there, and I've seen this factual, this ain't no, this is experience. I've been in a hospital with people who've been in pain, and I went out to the nurse and said, nurse, she's in pain, and they came in there with a, in an adjective form, like, an you know, agitated, agitated. Oh, yeah, yeah. because <laughs> you're agitated. asking it. you're asking yeah. for, well, man, we gave you your pills three hours ago, your next time for pills don't come up, and, 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 and instead of being compassionate, and, and, and understanding that certain persons in pain. And assuming stereotypically that you're asking early because you want to abuse it or do whatever right. or whatever. Right. You know, um, First of all, I've been a member of the black community all my life. I would think. You know, let me see. <laughs> let me take another look at you. <laughs> you know, we just changed though. We used to whisper, we used to whisper things like, and let me see if y'all remember this. Remember when mm -hmm. cocaine, there was a lot of people using cocaine. And as long as those people using cocaine were people of color, wasn't a problem. Do you remember we used to whisper when they got out into the suburbs? Yeah. Now it's a war on drugs. Yeah. And now you got commercials. This is your brain on drugs. Mm -hmm. The media is trying to shape, you know, people. I actually have that poster. About, and wow. then about, about wow. with the eggs and stuff. Right. So yeah. This is your yeah. this, yeah. this is your war on drugs. drugs. Yeah. So this is something that isn't new. It's just more blatant now. It's just more blatant. I was listening to what Andre was talking about. I remember it was a governor, um, a Republican governor who told a story of an intern that he had who was using drugs and he would cop in Camden before he would go to, yeah, you know the yeah, story yeah, talking about? Yeah, yeah. They had a big push with this guy. This guy might have been, you know, in early recovery, two or three years, and they, you know, gave him a non-profit. You know, he was getting all these contracts from the, but then you have soldiers who have been in recovery for years who don't get recognized because I think the color of their skin, mm -hmm. where they're not, mm -hmm. you know, um, yeah. advocating to help people who are from the suburbs. And, and another thing is, 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 I work with members of the hip hop culture, right. um, people who identify through their taste in clothing, music, drug use, their values. They identify with the hip hop culture, and a troubling trend is how some of hip hop's most Famous rap artists glamorize the use of synthetic opiates in their in their songs as party drugs. You know, um, I can't name the artists. Uh, they got songs Papa Perk, Molly Percocet. Yeah. Everybody talking about drinking lean, which is an opiate, mm -hmm. but they don't know or they don't tell these impressionable youth that 80% of new heroin users started out abusing prescription pain pills. Mm -hmm. So what they telling these kids is, you know, hey, let's have fun and party and become a dope fiend. Yeah, yeah. You know, they might as well be singing dope fiend, dope fiend. Yeah. You know, because it's dope and a pill. It's the, the most negative side of the melting pot. If you know what I mean? When they talk about the melting pot. So now what happened is that the, the hip hop community now is talking about it in a positive way and seeing it like the way the white culture has historically seen it. And you almost get this like, we're all like one big family now. Yeah. But you know, okay. it's not true, but okay, but that's what they say. Even when the crack epidemic, if you can remember, the crack epidemic didn't get any notoriety, it didn't get much publicity until then bias died. Until when? Lynn Byers died. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And when Lynn Byers died, you had, you had someone that the, 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 the media can put out front and everybody can look at this, this, this basketball star at the height of his career, uh, smoking coke. Because remember, we had already heard stories about 
Richard Pryor burned himself up, but they were calling it freebasing. Yeah, yeah. So we didn't have the, we didn't understand what it was. We didn't, but that was going on. That freebase thing was going on in yeah. Hollywood. Well, for that's smokable long. coke. That's, that was basically crack. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, yeah, they, they yeah, did yeah, it their yeah. own So, but when Lynn Byers died, and the death that was in the community with crack wasn't basically almost done by the attic itself. It was by the dealers and the, and the money, mm -hmm. the amount of money that was coming into the community that people hadn't seen. So even when we go back to that, that's still a point of how poverty and discrimination has came back to help out, hurt our community because poverty makes a person do some things that they want to live a certain type of lifestyle, you're going to take certain risks. Well, and you know, you know what's interesting about that is that people say, I'm going on vacation. Right. And that vaca if you remember, and the vacation was, I'm going to go do some crack. Right. Yeah, or I'm yeah. going to shoot some heroin. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they would be, that's their vacation. They're going, that's their Florida. Right. I, I mean, I remember Got people you. talking I was about that. Andre. Andre, Andre made a good point about um, classism within cultures, mm -hmm. how sometimes people of color discriminate towards people of color. Even in the cocaine mm -hmm. usage, yeah. there used to be cultural bias mm. with a person who snorted cocaine. That's right. A yes. person who smoked, smoked it. Right. To, the, to the crack, to the crack yeah, And it. also yeah. the shooters. Right. There oh, was yeah, a discrimination. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Any shooting base, you did. Freebase was really, really expensive. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 When it was turned into crack, that mm -hmm. was, okay, it was, it was, it was cheap. It was baking sodas for the poor uh, people. Right. Let me, let me tell you a story. Um, this has to do with racism too, or culturalism, or you know, cultural bias. That's what I want to say. Um, there was a mayor. I'm not going to mention his name. Um, long time ago, yeah, yeah, he yeah. lost his job. He lost his job because oh, he was I remember the one in Washington. The, right. the Washington. Yeah, one in Washington. Mayor Washington. Mayor Barry. Barry. Mayor, yeah, yeah. Mayor. Did you say his name? Okay. Mayor Barry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Mayor, he was pretty Mayor, public that one. Marion <laughs> Barry lost his job because he was filmed in a hotel room smoking. smoking. Yeah, smoking. That's right. right. When he had to resign. I watched him stand on the podium and said, I'm going to resign, and what I'm going to do, I'm going to go seek treatment for my addiction to alcohol. Uh, That's because it is soci more socially acceptable to be an alcoholic and recover true. than That's a true. crack addict. Now, I, I listened to this, and I'm like, I saw the film. Yeah. I didn't see a bottle of liquor in the hotel room. At all. Right. Yeah, yeah. No, it's you're right. It's just that the stigma... That, so even even people who use drugs, if I'm a crack addict, I can feel better than a person who a heroin uses addict. heroin. Yeah, and, oh, definitely. and a shooter. Right. A if shooter. you're a not shooter, right. if you're a snorter or a smoker. Well, what's interesting about that story is they even. They, the public voted them back. Yeah, them back. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, voted them back. Yeah. And, and, and I want to say that's an example of um, people getting second chances and the power Good. of recovery Good point. and mm -hmm. resilience. Good point. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, I would like to say that. Uh, another thing I want to say, now when we have this opiate epidemic, and I can speak for myself. I'm a person in long-term recovery. Uh -huh. um, I've been clean for over 27 years. Um, I used crack cocaine for about four years from 1986 to 1990. And I didn't get a lot of the soft, cushy treatment. You know, I had to hide the fact that I was, sure. you know, in recovery. Yeah. I felt embarrassed. I didn't want to be called a crackhead, mind you. So I, I got clean, worked a program of recovery, went back to school, became a counselor. Now I'm helping people. Mm -hmm. So now I'm helping people who are impacted by the opiate addiction. And I have to remember that, you know, addiction isn't a moral deficiency, right. it's a disease. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I gotta treat people very, very, you know, understanding with unconditional positive regard. It took a while for me to get past my anger. Yeah. It took yeah. a while. Because to be honest, now people are dying. I need to treat anyone right. the best way that I can, no matter what their color is. But I have to admit, initially I was it was I was a little conflicted. Yeah. Well, because I think that's fairly I normal. Yeah, I think that's... I go to meetings, and, and Andre and I go to meetings where we're sitting in meetings, and they're investing $13 million in intervention to help people. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, where was all of this back in 86? Yeah. I work in places, and I told you the story of how I grew up in North Philadelphia, and the 54 bus from 33rd Street to 8th Street, black people, from 8th Street to 2nd Street, Latinos, and from 2nd Street to the end of the line, white people. Mm -hmm. But when we take these $13 million and develop this intervention, all the work is going down. To the two, down the bottom right. part. 
because because the Badlands is ground zero for the opiate epidemic in Philadelphia. So I'm asking myself, I, I, you know, what about the people at 25th and Lehigh? Yeah, right. What about the people at 8th and Lehigh? Right. You know what I mean? We got all this, these services, these resources, these safe injection sites, yeah. all along for that part of the bus route. But it's other parts of the bus route, and they're feeling neglected. And this is the day. Yeah, and I think just for the audiences, uh, the Badlands is basically the Kensington, right. Port Richmond, I yeah. forget what district it is, police district, 24th, 25th. 25th. And they, they've historically called that the Badlands because yeah. of yeah. Needle Park and, mm -hmm. you know, Gurney Street. And but, but, you know, when you think about that, how communities are played with, different communities are known for this. Mm. Like, if you go to 17th and Jefferson, that's pills, pills and syrup. Yeah. Pills and syrup. Yeah. You know, um, South Philly has their own order of business well, down here. You could almost tell the neighborhood someone comes from. If they said they were on meth, they were from <laughs> South Philly. South Philly. Originally. Right. T's and D's was North Philly. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember Tower and Benadryl? Yeah. yeah. That yeah. was North Philly. Mm. So you could almost listen to the, the name of the drug because that's the popularity mm. of that drug in a certain sex. I don't know if that's true anymore. I do know that when they used to sell coke and heroin, the colors would determine the dealer's neighborhood <laughs> that you couldn't play with. Yeah. In other words, if it was a red yeah. label, that meant it was from 25th to 20th Street, from where to where. Yeah. And if you had green or blue or yellow, you're buying outside, and they would get irritated. I don't know if you remember yeah. that. but that, you know. I didn't have, and Ronald can tell you, I didn't have any, when I looked at this open use disorder, I didn't look at it from a racial standpoint, right? And I didn't see it that way. I just seen lives being lost. Yeah. I think from my personal experience, um, because I came from a, a, a form of recovery that had a, a real high stigma. Mm -hmm. So my process of treatment came through medically assisted treatment. And for people who may not know what that is, methadone, suboxone, Vivitrol. So, um, and in that community, that was we had it was a, it's, that's a culture within a culture yeah. in the treatment world, right? Oh, yeah. So that's a treatment process that's put to the side. You're not clean. We don't respect your recovery. We don't even want you to go to recovery meetings. Some people. Right, we don't, I'm don't, not saying that. I don't believe meeting, that. But don't talk. Don't, don't talk. say a word. Yeah, don't say a word. Because you you're still getting high, yeah, technically, right, you know. according to them. I don't believe that, but that's what they would say. Right. So you're not in therapy. You're just in replacement. That's right. right? That's right. <laughs> so, that's right. Replacement. So when I came out, you know, detoxed off the medication, got off the medication, got clean, and and did my process of uh, my 12-step process outside of that. Then I'd be, you know, working for the department. I started created an advocacy group where I went out and started advocating for people on MAT. And what what I gradually began to see was when I went to an MAT program, as as I said, it was like Derek had mentioned in, uh, earlier. It was older black men, mm -hmm. maybe some Vietnam vets, um, who weren't lucky enough to come home and get off. Like yeah. the statistics said, and most Vietnam vets came home within one or two years, they were clean. Mm -hmm. But these guys weren't. So, you know, and it was older black men, um, you know, older black women uh, from that 70s drug opiate use, this opiate epidemic we had in the methadone program. But gradually what began to happen was these programs began to be filled with young white kids. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Young white kids, all young white kids, man. Like, you know, they were pushing the blacks to the side. They were just opening space for, like, we got to do something. And that's when I began to see the way they began to uh, offer treatment to them made me start looking at mm -hmm. it like at, the, the at way y'all didn't, uh, didn't offer us that. <laughs> y'all yeah. didn't give and, us and, that. And in reality, color changed the delivery color of service. Right. Delivery yeah. service. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The service mechanism. The department start taking a notice to it and you start getting certain people invited to it and you start getting certain advocacy groups throughout the city want to have mm -hmm. support groups mm -hmm. and for MAT and mm -hmm. well, you can have a voice today and there's certain things begin to happen around this mechanism that was like MAT be, begin to come. You start seeing billboards for some boxing and Vivitrol commercials and you start seeing this whole thing change. Mm -hmm. And I think at that point I begin to see race being involved. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. From but, my own walk I start yeah. seeing how y'all treated me when I was a uh, uh, you know, to say this before a heroin addict who walked into an MAT because I never intervened and used drugs. I had to go home and find a 
can you find, imagine how humiliating it is? You got to go home and find somebody that can write a letter to say, yeah, I experienced him using heroin yeah. because I couldn't pull my arm up and show tracks. Yeah, yeah. That I wasn't in prison. I didn't, I didn't have the, I didn't have the statistical past or history of an average heroin addict. I didn't do bits, which was his prison. I was educated, had college education, um, and I didn't use intravenous drug use. So mm -hmm. I had to jump over hoops to get in. Yeah, and still, it's still. Not, I think the regulation because when I ran the methadone, like uh, codeine is not a drug, even though it's in, in the opioid fam opiate right. family, is not an admissible drug into mm -hmm. methadone programs. Right. It's not quote a strong enough opiate right. or something. Yeah. That's like the craziest Town thing. All three, right. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. you you know, when I think about how race and drugs play a major role, and I think of all the people who have passed on, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, high polluted people, musicians, and, and and now society begins to take another look. When you think about Michael Jackson and Prince oh, and all these other people, you start society starts to say, "Wow, now it's forefront. Everybody knows. Mm -hmm. Oh, every every listen." Nobody is uh, drug proof, you know. You think about that. Well, and it's how a real society, drug culture. I mean, really. you, you mentioned you look at how media perpetuates this whole thing through commercials and advertisement. It's a market of folks galvanizing them to make money. Mm. Well, just think about the, uh, if, if you're ever treating people in addiction. You know, they they want a quick fix for their recovery right. too. They don't want to put in. Nobody wants to put in. Work. They don't want to put in the time. Yeah. So they don't want to say, "What do you mean meditation or yoga? You know, <laughs> what are you nuts? Just give me like benzos yeah. or something." I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, with regards to treating, there's a level of racism in the treatment that's delivered. Hear me out. A lot of the guys that I work with, um, I work with at-risk youths and men who are returning from incarceration, returning citizens. Yeah. Um, a lot of these guys are people of color. Mm -hmm. They're from cultures who historically have been resistant to treatment. Right. So the only thing that they get when they come here is treatment, which they're unprepared for. Yeah. They have negative treatment outcomes and negative treatment experiences because they don't have the skills to function in treatment. Right. Follow me. In order to have a positive treatment episode, you need to be able to do a few things. Number one, admit that there's a problem, ask for help, mm -hmm. express feelings, and you might have to cry a little bit. Right. <laughs> All skills that are discouraged in communities of color. These people live in disorganized yeah. neighborhoods where you have to be guarded. You're not going to be vulnerable. You don't do positive interaction. Right. So what happens is a new bunch of people in recovery are accessing treatment and the programs are using outdated interventions because the people can't relate to the older members. They don't, right. older members don't understand the different ways to recovery. Mm -hmm. They think, you know, you're, you're, you're either abstinence or you're not in recovery. They don't understand a person that, you know, partial recovery, moderated recovery, mm -hmm. harm reduction. They don't understand all of that. Uh, a lot of the younger people have used different drugs. You know, they go into these treatment facilities and hear about people telling stories of prostitution, homelessness, and crack. And young people like, you know, I, I didn't do all that. You yeah. know, I'm only here because, you know, I, I smoke weed. I'm my probation officer. So they're not even good in good treatment because the people aren't culturally, who, culturally responsive enough to modify the way that they deliver treatment services. And if we think about race and drugs, most of the time when African American or people of color would go into treatment, they saw a white guy. Right. 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 <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, that they can't relate to, can't and they figure, to. well, that's the same white guy that arrested, not that one, but you know what right. I mean, that's I got true. arrested that way for still sharing. Still an authoritative rate. He's still an authoritative position. Yes, and that creates a certain right. problem, so you, you start to say, well, we need to Absolutely. integrate the, no. the treatment community with more people of color so right. that, that, that there's a certain... Or people, with, or people with, with lived, ex lived experiences. Yeah, but even then, as a person with lived experience, mm -hmm. um, it takes me much longer when I was treating mm -hmm. people to get past this. Mm -hmm. right. You, right. you, you yeah, know what I mean? The experience didn't matter. They still seen a white man. Yeah. yeah. But the reality of it is, we mentioned this earlier, in the early stages of uh, the best clinicians, the best therapists were people who had lived experience. Right. right. But right. what did they do to change the parameters? We had to raise the bar those guys that were in recovery, whether they were black or brown, how do we raise the bar? We yeah. let them go to school because yeah, yeah. these young other folks, of uh, not of the same uh, nationality or origin, we have to raise the bar and make them 
Because if you go around all the city of Philadelphia treatment programs, how many African American brown people you see near working as clinicians and therapists? Majority. It's small. Mm -hmm. it's very small. Yeah. All right. And a uh, lot of the ways they do that is um, that's that's an excellent point. Yeah. Um, it's a term called being resume checked. Resume checked is somebody asked me what school I went to. Mm -hmm. And depending on what school I went to, in their mind, they're going to determine how much respect they're going to give me. That's true. Yeah. So if I went to an Ivy League school, it's like, okay. Yeah. yeah. But then if I went to a, you know, a party But then school, if, you're, if, you're, uh, if you're a person of color, they <laughs> right. might say, did you get in under the minority set-aside money? Right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah, did you get grandfathered right. into that university? Right. Did you, so you hear that, happening? too? One of the things that I've experienced a lot of, and you made a great point, um, some of the more widely used evidence-based practice models are used because they're cost-effective. And what I mean by that, I'm not going to mention the names. You can have an uh, intervention that says we're going to use 10 sessions mm -hmm. to help you change this behavior. Problem is when you're dealing with people of color, it takes five sessions just to develop a therapeutic alliance. Right, yes. Whereas just to people, say hello. Right, right, with white people, because they have been trained and they know they've experienced therapy, they know therapy works, session one, they're coming in, expressing feelings, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, yeah. getting, you know, but people of color, you know, we're guarded, you know, we've experienced racism, and then when we want to share that we've experienced racism, the person that's white, you know, they become defensive because I didn't do it, and we know that you didn't do it. So there's a stumbling block. Yeah. So all I'm saying is you have five or six sessions wasted. One of the things I propose, and I, I talk about this a lot with people, is sort of like a role induction, where you have like a pre-therapy, where you have a level of care before therapy where you're taught how to express feelings. Well, address yeah, the stigma. Learn the of, culture right, of learn treatment. Learn the culture mm -hmm. of treatment. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that will increase the likelihood of people having better yeah. treatment mm -hmm. outcomes. But, but I think now both sides are experiencing a, a, um, a reluctance to treatment from, from, because these young white kids ain't going to M MAT programs either. Mm. They not adhering to treatment either. They're not compliant to coming in. You know, dealing with a lot of MAT programs uh, in my private time, they'll tell you the problem is they can't even keep them in there. They can't keep nobody. This, mm -hmm. So basically when you're looking at a lot of these programs are not, are not to capacity, that's why they're trying to find more routes of treatment to deal with this. They find it's a box and it's finding river trawl. They're trying to, you know, the gold standard for the opioid use disorder Statistic has shown that MAT is a gold standard for yeah. it, right? Um, we know it works. Statistic facts show tell us it works. And, and, and what we is, know it works, but interesting enough, the people in the environment, the people who make the law, they don't like it, right? And they don't believe it, right? And, 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 and what we've seen with bias and race, going back to that, is that this opiate use disorder changed. Because it ain't the guy coming under the L that's shooting dope no more. Mm -hmm. It's the guy from Bucks County, Chester mm -hmm. County, yeah. New Jersey. He can go to a private doctor. He could be having a great job on a company and go in the office and, and sit beside his coworker. And where we have been a black man, he might have called and got him fired. Now they're going to offer him treatment. They're going to do a lot of stuff. Uh, he, 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 he have an accident with the truck. He's a truck driver. He's, nine times out of ten, it might be some terms where he's not going to lose his job. He's going to get treatment right away. So it's, it's even instances where we don't see it happening, where it's being covered in places where you can't even put statistical charts and rates on it mm -hmm. because it's just discrimination, period. You got me? Yeah, just yeah. How, how is this affecting our community? But let me go to work high. Mm. Nobody's yeah. not going to create, they're not going to quibble it to or, 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 or contribute it to, oh, he has an open use disorder. He's, we need to get him some help. It's going to be how I'm going to be dealt with is different. So yeah, will, yeah, it's, 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 it's eyes on this thing that we all don't see that people are getting passes because of their color and this open use disorder, uh, you got shows like Intervention and all that stuff mm -hmm. coming in. And most of the time you watch Intervention, how often have you watched Intervention and it's been a bit about a black family? Mm -hmm. Well, at some do you see intervention be about a black family in the hood? Intervention is most about white, white family people. in the suburbs um, uh, uh, dealing with this uh, uh, disease of addiction, this, mm -hmm. this destructive disease that affects people's lives. You know, when you think about that, and I'm thinking of the, the prison 
uh, status of the president. Mm -hmm. How many folks that are of African American culture, black or brown people, what are the numbers about increasingly in prison mm. opposed to the opiate user uh, that is white? Has those numbers increased with incarceration? That's right. You're right. Well, whites well, don't get incarcerated. They, don't get in they, they, they generally don't. That, that's my whole point. Yeah. I, there's a famous rapper. Um, Me? Who, um, no, there's a famous <laughs> rapper who, um, the Meek Mills case. I thought it was a Travis the Justice. Yeah, well, and I, I might so. be wrong. I might be wrong. But I think somewhere I heard um, it being reported that Meek said that he was abusing Percocets. Now, mm -hmm. I don't know if that's true or anything, but mm -hmm. I think TMZ said mm -hmm. that. You know. When I heard that, I'm like, well, why is he getting sentenced to jail? Because as, as a therapist, when I hear a person goes in front of the judge and says, I'm using Percocet, they get inpatient treatment, they get yeah. intensive outpatient treatment, right. yeah. they get OP, and then they might get uh, strongly suggested to attend meetings or do church or do meditation. They don't go to jail, which is why I thought that, you know, I was a little concerned. Now, yeah. is it because um, he's African-American? Well, I don't know, but that, but this is one of the things I was thinking about while you were talking. Now, I want to play devil's advocate. I'm totally for saving lives. I understand that this opiate addi addiction, Andre helped me realize it all the time. People are dying and we need to do something. So I understand mm -hmm. this. But imagine this, 1986, Ethan Butler. Um, there's a house <laughs> yeah. where people are getting high, but you have a doctor in there you know, making sure that nobody overdoses. <laughs> you know, you have a couple of therapists there, intake workers saying yeah. that after you smoke your crack, you know, I might can get you, you know, right. home and shelter. You know, I might can get you. Give you a warm hand, yeah, yeah, yeah. we'll help you move you know from I mean? one place to another. Could, could we do it with that? the opiates, but not with yeah, the crack. Right. Could you envision you that? notice that? Yeah. Now, Manual. I say that, now, I say that because, you know, um, safe injection sites are a hot topic in Philadelphia. You know, I'm conflicted. I, I, I want to see people get, get well. And, and, and if they want to do that, I will be all for it. I'm just concerned that, and I'm going to give you a, an example. That's a bad example. Um, somebody's being stabbed, and they're bleeding, and they're bleeding over this white carpet. You know, we value the white carpet. Mm -hmm. We don't want the carpet to get messed up. So we put plastic on it so we don't get any blood on the carpet. Mm -hmm. That's what safe injection sites are to me. We're not going to stop the person from being stabbed. No, the only, the, the expectation the in is, though, yeah, I mean, I'll defer ahead. to you in a sense, but the, the, sure. the whole concept of the safe injection, and I'll defer to Andre eventually because I know he works in that area. Mm -hmm. The whole concept of a safe injection site is to also provide services, treatment kind of things, or get them moving. We'll get in touch with people yeah. who wouldn't basically come in, come they wouldn't, in no you wouldn't round see them. of services, but yeah. they'll be back in shooting galleries. Then you're looking at a population health, and I got that from you, yeah. the social determinants, the population health. Look at the money we be saving. Nine times out of ten, due to use of intravenous drugs, he can he gonna he can contract HIV, mm -hmm. hepatitis. That even when he gets his life together, he has long term ailments that addiction going to bring on. So you might don't. I, I wouldn't want a young man at 21 years old right now have to deal with catching HIV and five years from now he gets himself together and he's living with a long, lifelong illness. That's one of the reasons I never shot, I never intervened, I never shot because that fear of HIV and hepatitis was always a fear of my addiction. So we looking at that, we saving money with that, we saving money in a lot of other places because we bringing him in, we bringing him in the realm of services. If we continue to keep bringing him in the realm of services, mm -hmm. one day he might say, yeah, let me take it. Right. Instead of having him under the L somewhere, sharing dirty needles, um, uh, uh, it is a harm reduction model. It's a, harm, it's it's a, a different harm model. model. Because they're, 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 they're going to shoot dope. They're going to shoot the dope. They're going to shoot it either way. And I, I know that on the faith. Either way, they're going to shoot it either way. But I got a problem with all that. And, 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 and I've been asked several times, Rick, what's your thoughts? Not, and I need to be honest, is it legal to use drugs? Is it legal to sell drugs? Right. Mm. Now, and I think there needs to be more discussion, more discussion not by the city of Philadelphia, but overall, right, citizens. folks need to know we're at a time that we're way out of line with this whole thing with the queues, safe injection sites. Think about this. You know, I've sat in some of those meetings with city council yeah. and some of the city council reps and some folks from the Department of Beverly Health. Here's what bothers me with that. We're ever going to put it at? You got to, you got to get zoned, right? In the RSL, it got to go. It has to go before a group of people to say, "Hey, we don't want that here." 
right? Second thing is liability. Who's going to pay? Who's going to do the funding for this? And what's the liability connected to it? Now, wherever you put this at, now, I, listen, we believe in saving lives, mm -hmm. but we, it needs to be more discussion. More discussion. But you would agree, let me, let me just say two times, and I, and I think, of, let me just go back to like the Narcan thought. You know, Narcan actually delays death if there's not an intervention. That's right. That's what Narcan does. And we can call it what we want. Yeah, yeah. And for people who don't know what Narcan is, you know, mm -hmm. it revives people out of an overdose for the opiates. Naloxone. So, uh, yeah, naloxone. Now, so here's the point, that if I, if I revive you, I just revive you to spend more time in your addiction if I don't have a warm hand moving yeah. you from one place to another. Yeah. So it, it's really just a delay in death yeah. in reality. That's what the injection sites to me are. That's a place where people are shooting drugs anyway out in the street. We're going to give them a safe place to come, but we also have to surround that place with a lot of service, service. Right. or else it's, it's totally meaningless. We're just saying, oh, look, here's a nice place to come and get high. This was the point I that mean, I was trying to make. Yeah. I agree with everyone on the board. You make some valid points. I'm about helping. I'm about saving lives. But my thing is, why are we addressing the addict? Why, what we're saying is we're going to allow the pharmaceutical companies to continue making money, mm -hmm. the drug dealers to continue making money. We just don't mm -hmm. want anybody to die from it. Why don't we put all of this effort into stopping that? Yeah. I don't know what we can do, you know, arrest docs, arrest, I mean, they try things, we arrest to dealers, in. arrest dealers who, mm -hmm. yeah. they can trace a batch of fentanyl back to you yeah, to overdose, to a, yeah. life sentence. I don't, I don't know. I don't, yeah. But let, why, just like when we heard uh, the war on drugs originally, and Michelle Alexander talks about yeah, this. Yeah, Michelle about, does talk a lot about uh, it. When, when we heard of the war on drugs, it sounded like they're going to have these interventions to lock up these kingpins and these drug pill dealers and all of that but it was just the opposite they yeah. were going after the low-hanging fruit right they were dealing with the victims so instead of spending millions and millions of dollars and resources fixing oh. the victim yeah let's eliminate the problem yeah. but we had 1700 we had 1700 deaths last year basically my numbers might be right i know in 2016 we had six 600 deaths six and seven hundred deaths um Right now, they're going to shoot whether we help them or not. Right. Right. So if we focus on why they're not shooting, then we really be wasting our time because people being in recovery ourselves know that you ain't ready to get yourself together until you ready. Right. So if I'm not ready to get myself together, what do I do? No, don't offer you no, no support. And if I know it's a, a way that I can help you from dying and you're going to have to come to a point in your own personal life where you decide recovery is what you want, because I can't tell you recovery is what you want, but if I can help you from dying, because all they want to do is get high. Mm -hmm. Let's stay with that. They don't want a death sentence. They ain't trying to die. They just want to shoot something up, go somewhere, and not. Everybody else overdoses, I don't. Right, so mm -hmm. I, if I know, why would I be so humane to say, go ahead and shoot up with the risk of dying because that's what you need to do? No, if I know I can right. save your life and all you want to do is get high, then I'm not going to be and sensitive to understand that that man ain't trying to shoot down, it. he ain't sitting down to put a needle on his arm to die. He's sitting out putting a needle on his arm to, to get high and do... He's actually putting his arm to, to stay alive. So what y'all saying, right. so what and, saying and is it's impossible to imagine that if we take away what they're getting high from, because I know they want to get high, but if we stop the flow of what they get high, that would eliminate the death toll. But, that's, but right now we're talking about the day. That, what you're yeah. talking about is something that's going to have to be done in term. And we're talking about the Probably. day. We're talking about the boys going right now, while Rick always say... Rick, famous thing is somebody's dying right now, yeah. somebody's getting a phone call mm -hmm. right now, right? Somebody done left their house while we sitting here right. with $10 in their pocket, but, they walking cops so, somewhere and don't know that it's fitting on that dope he got. Right, and also put this in perspective, the topic today, race and drugs. Why aren't we going after the pharmaceutical industries? They're all white. Right. <laughs> Who owns the pharmaceutical industries? That's right. There's not a lot of black people or people well, of color think about what owning pharmaceutical companies. They're making all those profits on the distribution of those medications. Look what they did, though. They got lobbyists around yeah. to be able to allow them the regulations. When you went to the hospital, it was it was due regulations and, and, and policy that the doctor would ask you, what's your 
uh, pain scale. Right. And mm -hmm. you couldn't leave the hospital if you wasn't up. If, you, if your pain scale was 10, then he had to make sure you were comfortable. So they wrote pills to make sure you yeah. were comfortable. And the irony of the so, show, the irony of the show is that people are going to watch it, some people, and they're going to say, oh, they're just a bunch of crazy four people over there being crazy right. uh, and blaming, you know, racism for drug abuse. Uh, but in reality, when you sit back and look at, I mean, even simple things like, when Coke was around, it, it, the Coke was expensive, and what was it called? It was called the White Lady. Right. Yeah. When the the when the uh, uh, methamphetamine, the biamphetamine came, it was called, and it was cheap. It was called the Black Beauty. Remember the black? Yeah. So you can get a cheap high, and it's called the Black well, Beauty. Rock said yeah. Cocaine. So so I think about, about it cocaine. when you're, you're just using the drug. Michael Dean, all the same about yeah. cocaine. They got yeah. a group out there now called War on Drugs. It, Okay. There's a musical group called War on Drugs. What do you think about this here? I think of Eric Clapton and cocaine, cocaine, and all the songs. Okay, right. okay, you know, okay, okay. folks need to understand that. And, uh, and I, this is just me again. Mm. I think we need to spend more money on prevention and intervention. Yeah. Because mm, yes. um, historically, we've never stopped the war on drugs. Let's be clear. We will. This we in a society that there will, drugs will always be drugs. You look at the movement of drugs every 10 years, there's a new drug. There's something that's yeah. always evolving around. Uh, now it's critical. Now society, I think a governor from New Jersey, you know, he's even making commercials. Everybody wants well, to make a commercial. It's, it's like a good thing to do now, make commercials. Yeah, make commercials. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you know, you know, just as another thought, because I, I go back history a little bit and I think about, remember when the HIV infection and AIDS, etc., is was a phenomenon of the 70s, and we didn't know about it for like 10 years later. In other words, you, you could have the infection, but the symptoms wouldn't show up, right. you know, I don't know, eight or 10 years later. It started to show up around 1980 when the Coke epidemic kind of started to, mm -hmm. and no one paid attention to it because who was infected? Gays, yeah. gay men, gay uh, people of color, right. Latin, you know, you know, you know, black and brown people. Mm -hmm. But once it got into like, yeah. The white community, what happened? Right. We now have medication that rests it. We got this, mm -hmm. we got that. It was almost like, well, let them die. Well, and you, I, know I mean, you, know, you know what's interesting? They stabilized the increase. Yeah. People started living with HIV, yeah. mm -hmm. getting good meds. So now it's not a crisis anymore. No, it so isn't. So it's not in the news. Right. If you look at the statistics right now, while it's not in the news, What's the highest incidence of HIV contraption? Young, 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 young African American, young women. African -American right. so not, women. It's not, it's not on the commercials right. anymore now. But did you know this? MAT, methadone programs, were uh, uh, proliferation, I won't say the proliferation of, all these methadone programs. It had nothing to do with heroin. It had to do, like you go back oh, to yeah, HIV. They didn't need. They didn't want them out there sharing needles. Sure, yes. Yeah. So and they that put them drug addicts. They, a lot of people numbers like drugs. Heroin users. They needed to. They needed to somehow diminish the number of drug users out there sharing needles during the eighties, early eighties, and through the nineties. So they had to start putting a lot of intervention in, in the MAT methadone program. Yeah. So methadone programs really didn't get the populated. The populated. The way it populated the community had nothing to do. Well, with you know, drug there's use. very, very. As I don't have to tell you, there's very few methadone programs in white areas. Right. You know, all the white guys have I to come down to 21st of Washington I, I or 12th of Florida. You know, places like that. And and even from Bucks County, they yeah. they, they, they don't have in. a heroin addict out there. They come in town. They come in town yeah. to they get come service. Town, and they go down Kensington. Inter interestingly and they get enough, down Kensington and they make bridges. They make cities under the bridges, and mm -hmm. and 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 you w would it be noticed if it was a bunch of black kids living under bridges? It probably wouldn't mm -hmm. be. It would probably be a scourge. They probably would say, "Look at them. They need to get them out there." The police probably be down there busting heads every day. Well, well, all it, them black kids. If them, history repeats itself, they'd be jailing them. They'd be jailing them. They would go down there and give them a day to get it. We going to, they, they had created tent cities under the under every hour when you uh, under mm -hmm. train station mm -hmm. where they can't get wet when you ride down Lehigh Avenue and police is just ride through. Had that been crack addicts laying but, under there just living in the streets, mm -mm. they'd have told them to get out of there. Well, think about the crack epidemic, which increased the population of homelessness. Mm -hmm. Cardboard City, all those spots. Uh, suburban station, all the shelters, 85% of the people that were there were black and brown people. Mm -hmm. 
And who was working with them? Reverend Wells, people like That's that. Right. Remember, you know, right. the people, no services. They, they were the only people providing service yeah, at the right time. No home to service I want to mention a I'm point um, about how I'm optimistic now um, yeah. with regards to race. Um, because you mentioned criminal justice, and that's, you know, it's all tied in. We have a new DA who is a person that isn't a person of color, mm -hmm. who's been willing to advocate for people of color, mm -hmm. and he's interested in using behavior health interventions in criminal justice. I just hope that when, because he said that people need counseling, and he understands that a lot of people have experienced undiagnosed and untreated trauma. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that a person who's not a person of color can kind of put some services in place for some people of color who mm -hmm. are suffering from a disease of addiction who have that has resulted in their involvement in the criminal justice system. I just hope, and I'm trying to reach out <laughs> and work with them. Mm -hmm. I just mm -hmm. hope that, because I believe that as a clinician, I understand how woefully ineffective traditional treatment is for people of color. I just hope he doesn't say, okay, we're gonna do counseling, but he uses the same old counselors counseling. that have been ineffective. White counselors who are culturally resistant to the people who they're serving. So like you said, we need some more counselors who look like the people that we're serving. I think that's true about most city. services in the yeah. city, yeah. the whole city. If, so if I hope you, the DA realizes yeah, that. Yeah. So when he get, has this new criminal justice reform, it includes, and I think, and, and I'm going to go on a limb by saying this, I think he's moving in the right direction because one of the first people that he appointed was a Muslim sister who was. Movita. Right. A Muslim sister who's the head of victim services. Peter Jones, right. my girl. That's one of the first people he and, picked. And it's funny, but he was also the guy that really was advocating for um, needle exchanges. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Black, Black Lives Matter, yeah. you know. So we, we have to. But let me, I mean, I, mean, I know, I, I just want to state just for the audience of that, that doesn't mean that there aren't people who are not in recovery that couldn't be very helpful. Right. You know, if you find a warm, empathic, sensitive person who maybe becomes an ally, as we refer to it sometime, mm -hmm. they could be helpful to people. Yeah. I don't want to necessarily yeah, say, I, I, I don't want to say, well, all you people who never had an addiction, you right. can't work in our field. I, absolutely. But yeah, we, absolutely. what we want to say is that you will have to develop a serious sensitivity yeah. to those yeah. issues. I think that at the, at the mainstay of treatment, compassion mm -hmm. is what? transcends all color. Right. Yeah. Compassion, patience, uh, tolerance transcends color. Um, and, and at this moment, um, I see, I really care about the lives that are being lost, and it doesn't matter to me, white, black, brown, mm -hmm. or blue. I, want, I don't want no mother to have to, or no father to have to feel the experience of somebody dying off of Drugs. I knew, probably can imagine. I never had an experience, but I can just. I've had friends die, so I know how I felt when my get a phone call. My friend has died and OD'd mm -hmm. off of drugs, right? So, a lot of times, I, I, I move along in this process, basically just trying to save lives. Yeah. Not the color. Just the life. Well, I think that's a good way to. You know, the, the hour goes fast when you're all the time, all the time. All the time. and right. that's probably a good way to end this this show. The, with the kind of hope that we could right. continue to w work with each other. But if I move along like that, then my people will be affected. I'll be able to save my people. I'll be able to save other people. Yeah. And, and at the end of the day, experiences come from both sides that add a better form of service because all we do is provide services. Yeah. That's all we do. We sit we around all day long and provide and service and, and provide hope. Provide hope Good. and healing for everybody. everybody. Well, that's all the time we have for today. I would like to thank my co-host, Rick Ford, and my two very special guests for sharing their life with us. I would also like to thank you, the viewers, for tuning in. You have been watching The Tapestry of Life on CCP-TV, the educational channel of Community College of Philadelphia. I am Dr. Pascal Scholes, Professor of Behavioral Health and Human Services and Director of the Office of Collegiate Recovery, Community College of Philadelphia. See you all next time.